I'm loving seeing everyone's faces. Just for folks who are just joining, a little flag reminder, we are trying to make this a very interactive discussion. So if you want, please share your screen. We wanna see you. We wanna hear you on the chat. Um, and I think with that, I'm looking at Hopin. We've got a couple people still joining, but I do think so we have as much discussion time as possible, we can get started. So hello everyone, I'm Jordan Bussey. I'm a senior um, associate for our national and state partnerships team at the Education Trust in our national office. Um, I'm very excited to have everyone joining us today for this um, session on implementing creative advocacy techniques in the time of COVID. I think we've all had to rethink some of the ways that we're taking action on the issues we care most about, um, both from a tactics perspective and what we do, but also how we approach working with partners and working with students and maintaining um, our efforts in this time that we call COVID. I am joined by two wonderful colleagues who I'm gonna to ask to introduce themselves in just a moment, but I will also say that I think one thing that keeps all of us unified and is keeping us unified in this boot camp and in our work is the keeping a student-focused lens in the way that we're approaching our work, in the way that we approach partnerships, and in the voices that we raise most in our advocacy. So with that, um, Marielle and Bill Maurice, do you want to do a quick intro? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Vin Maris Gonzalez, and I'm the Senior Manager of Engagement Operations with the Education Trust in Tennessee office. Um, and what that means beyond just supporting like operational needs for the office is that I get to do some of the people work um, and engaging with our advocates and leaders, but more specifically with our students. Um, we have two initiatives where we've incorporated students with our, uh, onto our policy councils, which I'll share a little bit more about later in the session. Um, we have five students serving on those councils and then also our Empower Ed project, which is a student voice project that actually emerged during COVID-19. So I'm virtually working with 14 students across the state. So excited just to be here with you all, to see all your faces and screens and yeah, to share a bit more about like what we're working on in Tennessee. I am a big fan, you guys, of Team Tennessee. Um, <laughs> I constantly try to just like, insert myself into their conversations. Um, and I hear that Vilmaris is called uh, the student whisperer. Um, so I, I, I love uh, the work that you all do uh, and the way that you center our youth. Um, so I, as I believe you all know, <laughs> I'm Mariel Novas. Um, I'm the assistant director of partnerships and engagement um, in Massachusetts with that trust. And I, um, as I shared yesterday, convened the Massachusetts Education Equity Partnership, which is a collective of over, um, I think at this point, 35 advocacy organizations across the state, um, all of whom focus um, on everything from uh, civil rights, social justice, education. Uh, we have folks who come from the housing space, immigration, um, community empowerment, and really everything in between. Um, and it has been just the light of my life to be able to bring that group together um, especially during this time of pandemic when uh, I, I would have expected, you know, at the beginning of March that our engagement would have dropped off. Yes, Katie! Uh, you know, I would have expected that our, our, our engagement would have dropped off. People would have been so overtaxed, obviously, with um, everything going on for them personally and professionally. MEEP is, co is, is comprised mainly of um, community-based organizations and nonprofits that work most directly with um, our students and families in underserved communities. And so they, you know, they were the ones getting to work and, and, and really felt that emergency directly um, from, from their constituents. And so what we saw was the exact opposite. What we saw was a, a massive increase in engagement um, and a really turning to each other, which I'm so excited to share more about um, in this conversation. Thank you both. I'm so excited to have you know, a plethora of states here for this conversation and, and to dig in deeper um, into some of the great examples that both of your teams have been doing and setting for advocacy um, during COVID. I think we're gonna get started with a, an initial opening poll. We just want to be able to frame uh, our discussion time around what you are hoping to most get out of the, um, 
this discussion. So if you could take this quick poll um, and uh, we'll get started. Loving the activity. Thank you, everyone. All right, so it looks like so far people really want to get into the brass tacks of what are some like specific tactics and engagement opportunities that people are taking, um, as well as um, finding out what has and hasn't worked um, from our experiences during COVID at this time. Great, almost 100%. Thank you all so much. Okay, so moving into getting to hear about some of these specific tactics, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Marielle and Bill Maurice. Um, what, what have you and your organization been doing to address people's well-being and needs in this time? And I wanna start with this question just because I think our advocacy in the time of COVID is, has really been impacted because people's mental state, the way that we're working, the way that we're living is so different from the way we have. And I don't think we can address what we do until we address how we are interacting and, and taking care of ourselves and our partners. So starting with you, Marielle, um, can you tell us a bit about how, what you've been doing to address people's well-being and your partners at this time? Absolutely. And I will preface by saying um, that it is still very hard uh, for me to talk about this um, uh, because in my answer, I'm going to return back to March. Um, and uh, from March to May um, was a blur. <laughs> um, I'll start first with the, re the, the recognition that I had personally before I share um, what the recognition became for the partnership. Um, so during that time, um, you see, <laughs> um, I come from a family of uh, all essential workers. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, all of my family members, with the exception of me and my sister, um, work in some form of sort of food service or retail or, you know, at, in the pharmacies. And so um, what in, in, immediately, I felt that impact um, directly in my own family uh, with people being furloughed, um, trying to figure out my sister became sick, as I mentioned yesterday with COVID right in the middle of March. We couldn't get her food. We didn't know how um, my niece and nephew were going to be able to stay safe because both her and her wife um, were sick with COVID for a very long time. Um, and so I, I knew firsthand um, sort of like the, the, the fires that were emerging in so many of our communities. And then um, it wasn't until um, Natasha and I, who um, Natasha is the state director for Massachusetts. I know she's on the call. Um, so if at any point, Natasha, I say anything, you want to fact check me, just unmute yourself. <laughs> um, but we had a meeting in early March with our partners, never, um, with our partners about, you know, like an MOU that a, a school district was figuring out with the state. Um, and it was our own partners who said to us, um, like, hey, our, our families are freaking out. Uh, we don't know what's about to come down the pike. Um, and this was right before uh, schools all closed down. And with less than the three day heads up, all schools were closed. And so we kind of went into overdrive in figuring out, hold on, okay, there is a lot that we have to do. There's a lot of harm we have to work to mitigate. Um, there, 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 there's, even just like figuring out like where are our people how are our people you know there was that time you know that we all remember when it's just like at least in my end every day it felt like oh my gosh this person is sick oh my goodness this neighbor this family member and so um it was um harrowing uh and so what we quickly decided and, and, and again big shout out to team tennessee um was you know we have to figure out a structure by which we can come together and actually acknowledge what was happening with us, both in terms of like mind, body, and spirit. Um, this can't just be business as usual. We can't pretend like, frankly, people aren't dying um, all over and, and around us. And of course, as the months wore on, that was compounded um, with the movement uh, for Black Lives that um, 
has continued and been <laughs> from the beginning of, of our time as, uh, as a country, and yet we saw sort of this, this combination of things. And so we realized that um, we needed to bring our people together to see how they were doing. And Team Tennessee, and I'll let Vimaris talk about this, um, set up these like kind of like coffee chats um, in the mornings. I'm not a morning person, so we had to kind of like readapt that. <laughs> it wasn't with coffee, but it was in the middle of the day. Um, and we really just worked together with our partners. I, I brought some, some tools, and, and Jordan, if I'm going on too long, just wave me down. We, um, I, I, I was a middle school teacher, um, and I worked in Dorchester, which is a predominantly black and brown community in Boston. All of my students were newcomers from Latin America uh, who came and carried a lot of, of trauma and a lot of sort of uh, need to really uh, be filled from the inside out. And so I borrowed from those skills as a teacher and brought them into our space with me. And so, you know, would, would conduct our meetings in a way that honestly reflected, and I don't mean this in an infantilizing way at all, reflected sort of um, the social emotional supports that I was able to offer my students in the classroom. And so that meant starting off our meetings with check-ins that actually got folks to name how they were doing. And I did that in different ways. And sometimes it would be, what's the color of your aura this morning? And people would just like say the color of their aura. And I know this sounds really, really small, you guys, but the recognition of our humanity is critical particularly in a time when that is being beat out of us. And so I clearly have a lot more to say, but I'm gonna pause it there and try to bring in some other things later. Thank you, Bill Maurice. Yeah, thank you for the shout out, uh, Maria to Team Tennessee. And uh, don't worry, I, we did those at 8 a.m., but I am also not that much of a morning person. So there's that. Um, I'll also take it back to March. Uh, you know, well, I guess I'll take it back even further. Just for context, Tennessee, our office is a newer office for EdTrust, and we opened um, in January 2020, and we opened essentially virtually. We were a team of three, um, Alex and Jean are on the call too, so you can say hi to them. Um, and, you know, we were already meeting over like phone calls once a week in person. Jeannie was doing some one-on-one, one-on-ones with partners, but we hadn't really decided like what office are we going to like rent out or, you know, create or where are we going to host our first event? Like we didn't even get that far because COVID-19 happened. So our whole work actually has existed in this virtual space, which has been interesting. And then as far as like once COVID hit, I feel like March 13th is a massive marker, at least for folks down here in the South. That's when it felt like really everything just stopped, right? Like no more mass, you know, settings of anything, no school, none of that. So obviously we felt that transition and it was maybe about two weeks in that we just really identified the need to bring our closest partners because we were part of a coalition prior. So we already had some solidified partnerships across the state. So we already know who were those key players were and like folks that we that were involved in our work. So we just really identified the need to create a space and that space was called Coffee and Community. It happened every 8 a.m. on a Monday morning and there was really no set agenda besides like, how are you? And like, how are you really? Uh, you can share as personal as you want, as professionally as you want, really whatever you want your check-in time to be. Um, and I think it goes back to that humanizing this work piece, our humanity, like in order to do this work, which happens in mass and collective and movement, you have to ensure that like people are good and like people honestly still aren't doing that great, right? Like I don't know many people that are thriving right now. Um, we've definitely adjusted and adapted, but I think holding that space uh, was just really important. And to be honest, like Alexa and I were talking and prepping for this. We were, you know, reflecting on how some of those first sessions were really dark, right? They were heavy. Like people were processing what it meant in this moment of uncertainty, some of them were getting COVID, family members were getting COVID-19. So, you know, I think just providing that space to process is just really important when you're wanting to build community. And community is so essential to get this work done, at least in my eyes, in my opinion, and sort of how we do our work in Tennessee. And then I think just one plug for like the personal, I think like your well-being matters just as much. Um, and I know that I felt that shift in, uh, it was June and July, my partner got COVID. He then gave it to my parents. My parents had COVID. I started a June master class for my grad school program. Um, and my partner's grandfather passed away. And like, I felt like I was just crying on Zoom for like a whole month. 
and like Jeannie and Alexa were beyond supportive. But again, it's to understanding that also like sometimes you have to take a step back too in order to do this work well. So also just ha and I trust I need to take my own advice still. But I think also just understanding that your well-being matters just as much as the people that you're working with. So I'll leave it there. No, thank you both. I just think to that add to that, to, to add super quickly to, to the darkness um, and to normalize crying on Zooms. Um, your girl was out here leading Zooms and just like, just bawling. Um, well, I tried not to bawl. I tried to just let the, the teardrops fall. Um, and I only share that because I believe that um, leadership is incredibly important in this moment and um, courageous and moral leadership even more so. And by that, I mean um, those of us who are tasked with um, the work of providing space and holding space for others. Um, to Valmari's like direct point, like we have to take care of ourselves and we have to do that actually in a way that is explicit. We have to be able to send the signals to our people that when we say, hey, if you can't, if you can't do this, if you need a moment, take it, that we mean it. So we have to model that within ourselves. We have to tap into our own inner vulnerability. And to be really clear, right? Like that is not how the like policy and advocacy space moves, right? At all. Talking about feelings and crying on Zooms, right? And it's like, and my, my personal opinion, that is the, what is missing. That is the ingredient that we look around and we see from every level, um, you know, kind of like, like, do you have, you know, my mom would say, tiene sangre, tiene sangre, right? Like, are we sentient? Is there blood flowing through our veins? Because it is impossible to exist right now and look at our space and, and, and not feel. And so we need to in, imbue that into our advocacy because of the work that we do and who we do it with. Yeah, thank you both. I think the acknowledgement of humanity, the acknowledgement that we're all individuals in this work and that we as individuals make up a whole. I said this on my session earlier that in coalition there is strength and our partnerships are important and without caring for ourselves and our partners in this work, we can't, can, we can't be successful and we can't continue this. Um, uh, a brief uh, question, how are you, because, um, people are, so many people are working from home and so many people's, their home and work life are so intertwined right now and people can just feel inundated with information. Um, how are you communicating with your members to keep them engaged in your missions and work? And how has that kind of evolved throughout um, the pandemic? I'll go first, um, okay. Uh, so again, like I said, like we started this work not fully virtual, right, but without an office remotely. Um, so I think for Team Tennessee, like we've just really leaned into these virtual spaces because that's really all we've really had to work with. So just trying not to be intimidated by, you know, using different technologies and tactics online. Um, you know, again, we don't have an office, but we've been able through this time and work to launch two policy councils. We have a P12 policy council and a higher ed policy council, and we have five students that sit between both of those councils. And we convene those uh, groups every other month for about an hour and a half, and they are advising and giving input on what should our policy priorities be? What should our advocacy strategies be around what it is we're going to prioritize? Um, and also using it as a moment to learn in community too in those spaces. Um, through this time, we've launched Empower Ed. Um, and that was really, uh, that happened in partnership with our partners across the state. Like we reached out to them and we're like, hey, like we want to create this like virtual student community where we're equipping them with tools to be advocates and leaders. Um, and also getting an insight of like, what does it mean to be a student right now? Like in high school, but also in college and navigating COVID-19 and distant learning and hybrid and all these things that are going on. So they identified some of those students for us and bringing them into the mix, exposing them to different virtual events happening, uplifting them and hosting panel discussions uh, with Chalky and creating a space for students to really share how they are doing and what do they have to say to policymakers and folks who are in positions of power making decisions for them every day. 
Um, during this time, we've brought on two new staff members virtually. Um, we know one of them, like we, we know Reggie from a past life, but you know, we've never met Kia, but we're still just trying to build this community and connection through these virtual spaces. Um, and then of course, like just leaning on all digital communications, right? So regularly, like routinely sending e-communications and updates to events that we're hosting, which I'll share a little bit more about in detail um, in a few minutes. Um, and then also using Twitter to our advantage. Like Jeannie is a Twitter queen. Y'all um, follow her, Jeannie People Walker, um, and at Trust in Tennessee, because we, we stay tweeting. I feel like we're really active and that is a presence and that is also a way to engage uh, you know, supporters in this work. Thanks, Maria. I was just quoting Vilmaris. <laughs> we stay tweeting. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I, it's like I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter. It's like, man, I like have to like be a part of it to like get the word out and amplify our work. And I really hate it here. <laughs> um, so I love seeing Jeannie in the interwebs. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, to to kind of. Uh, clarify a little bit for those who um, are like sort of like less familiar with sort of the structure of, of the, the ed trusts that exist in different states. Um, so ed trust in Tennessee actually has an office and so um, their team is, is, is a bit larger. Um, in Massachusetts, Natasha and I are actually part of the national team um, and our work is focused on, um, on everything Massachusetts. I say that because we are um, a small but incredibly mighty and powerful team of two. So we had to figure out um, what made sense for us, given um, the huge size of our partnership and the fact that it's just um, she and I, to be able to um, to make um, to make that sort of uh, relational uh, consistency exist there, right? To make sure that um, we were hearing from our people, that they were hearing from us. So there are a couple of things that I would say um, we did with intentionality. The first is um, one-on-ones. It, it's, a, it's a little weird to be like, oh, hey, let's get coffee on Zoom. Um, but I've gotten lots of coffees and lunches on Zoom. Um, and you know, I'll make them half an hour sometimes just like, hey, whatever time you have between this time and this. Um, and again, it's sort of just like, how are you, girl? Like, tell me how you're doing. Like, what's going on out in Western Mass? Like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, you guys, has just been, I mean, wow. Just having that time. Um, I know I'm not saying anything like groundbreaking, like, oh my gosh, having a one on one with people. But, you know, with so much going on, I know there are days when I have seven back to back Zooms and life is insane. Taking time to connect one on one with people and just, and like see their kids running around the back. And like, and tell them like, hold her up to the camera. And just like, to be a person, to be a person. Again, I feel like I'm like, I'm like on this mountaintop right now. Just like, we have got to remember that we are people. Um, and you know, I always butcher the quote about like, people don't care what you do until they know you care or something about along those lines. So we have like really focused on letting our people know that we care. Um, letting them know that we're here. You know, I've sent so many texts and emails just being like, hey, just sending you light or, you know, thinking of you, <laughs> which might be weird coming from like a colleague in, you know, the space. And it's just like, no, I love you. No, like, I really do. Um, you know, like, I, I, I'm so grateful that you exist. Um, the second thing that we really did, and this, uh, we finally were able to get it up a around August, was to uh, facilitate our partner's ability to engage with each other without having to go through us, right? Without being like, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so, you should talk to each other and be friends. So we put together this um, internal meet guidebook. And in it, um, you know, we made sure, uh, this was fun, to pull like all the social media handles of all of our partners across three platforms, put it together neatly, um, then also pulled out um, everyone's uh, like name, email, the organization they're affiliated with, took time to like, list out and hyperlink every organization and their websites and their mission statement um, to allow for folks to kind of go into the guidebook and say, okay, I need other people who work, who are working on like youth development or college access. Like we're writing this letter to the department of higher education. We need some colleagues to like jump in on this with us. 
Um, and so they're able to go in um, and, and, uh, and um, connect with each other to make that happen. And the last thing um, that it has really just like worked well have been um, sort of these weekly resource roll-ups that we have conducted, again, to highlight the, there's so much going on y'all, especially with this virtual world that is insane and like Zoom here and this event there and webinar there is wild. And I knew for me, it was becoming really unwieldy to keep track of that. Certainly for our partners who are doing direct service work with our families and students and educators, they don't have time to sift through all of that, right? And so, yes, resource roll up. And so I've taken that time um, to source from our partners and the space what's happening that we need to know about. And, I, and, and so we share that communication once a week and that's been really helpful as well. Thank you. These are all very like specific, tangible things. So I appreciate that. And um, I will say, we're gonna be sending like a little one page tips and tricks document that kind of summarizes a lot of these pieces after the fact. So um, totally love um, the specificity of all of that. Um, kind of getting into a little bit of the, the nitty gritty, could you each speak to one or two successful events or actions that you've pushed through during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, what was the process, the, the level of participation you had? What was the specific ask that you had of people and the follow-up from that? Um, I would love to dive deep and we'll spend a, we'll spend a, a good amount of time um, hearing from these because I know they're very exciting. Um, let's start with Marielle. Okay. And I'm, I talk so much. <laughs> um, so one of the things that became very clear over the summer, um, and I will try to, to be uh, diplomatic here, um, was the egregiousness um, of how infrequently, if at all, our students and families were being asked what they thought and what they wanted, what they needed in this time. Um, there was a lot of making decisions for, what we saw was a continuation of a pattern that has existed since time immemorial around not including our families in decision making at the highest levels. Um, and that is just completely unacceptable at a time when we know for black and brown communities, um, the pandemics of COVID and systemic racism have disproportionately fallen on their backs. And so because of that, um, you know, I remember we had a conversation, Natasha and I, and we're just like, how can we write in this like weird like do we have a webinar like what that doesn't feel that doesn't feel like it captures the thing and what you know was like in my heart was just like i don't need to interpret for our families they have their own voices they they can tell us directly in whatever language they are comfortable in what they're thinking what they demand and so that's what we did we essentially um through a, a family forum last week titled hashtag hear our truth we launched our Meet the Moment Massachusetts campaign, which will take place throughout the course of this year and beyond with, an, with a focus explicitly on, we were like, okay, families, like grab that phone, whoever has it, flip it around, record yourself. Show us what this looks like. Tell us what your reality is. What is your truth? And let's amplify that. Let's make sure everyone understands what this looks like. Because it's, you know, as somebody who straddles a lot of different worlds, who's kind of like goes back to my family and, 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 and all, of, all of that, and then moves in this world, somebody who, you know, went to double IV, whatever. Like, y'all, I have existed in a lot of different bubbles and it's become really clear to me over time that we are spoken for way too much. And so what we did was we, we took these video testimonies of our students, of our families, we compiled them, big shout out to Leon um, Kai, who's our colleague here on, on the national team, into these just like beautiful works of self-expression um, of our families. And I'm like, I think I have the video queued, the internet is being weird, I, but I do wanna show a minute of it um, because we can never forget as advocates that our role is to clear the way for our families to walk forward. Um, and that is, that was our, our, our mission and our hope through this campaign um, and will be, of course. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to hope that the internet cooperates with me, y'all. Send light. Okay. 
if it pauses, I will just um, scroll it up ahead because it was pausing around second 44 when I was trying it out earlier. Okay. And Jordan, can you thumb, thumbs up if you can hear the, the sound? My name is Catherine Rivera and I'm going to show you how the remote learning looks at my house. This side used to be um, Joseph doing his um, remote learning with his own computer and Melexi used to do her work in her own computer. She also has a, all her paperwork here well organized and when it comes to do their work, uh, we had enough supplies. My name is Daniel Yurizar. And I'm Aiden Yurizar. We decide to move Aiden, so you're going to come with us very quick and we're going to move forward to a special um, room we built for Aiden. All right, here is uh, his, uh, his space for Aiden. So Aiden, you're going to come with us and what I did for Aiden in this case, um, I have to run I have to run a new wire for Wi-Fi uh, for Aiden. So like this is where I usually do my classwork and my keyboard and the mouse. And this is where I have my Wi-Fi and I mostly do my work here. But not on this, this, this screen, more like on like an iPad. And I have all my materials here and then when I'm done, I usually play the games. Hi, my name is Alejandra de la Cruz and I'm going to be telling you my experience with online slash virtual learning. We had like 45 minutes of class time. It didn't really help at all because it was like, you're sitting there and you're just listening to someone talk to you, you know? It didn't feel real. I'm the type of student that needs hands-on-hands -hands learning. So for sure, it felt like a struggle to me. And yeah, I didn't really like it. Also, the teachers did have office hours. But in those office hours, there were like 20 to 30 students that were confused. So it was like one hour for 30 students. And it would be times where they couldn't answer everyone's questions. And it took me having to text my teacher like 10 times a day or set up three virtual calls just out of her time from actually having to be a teacher in order for me to understand what I had to do. We do have um, internet. Uh, which is a, a huge challenge because every day is not the same. The bandwidth, some days are good and then the connection was bad the next day, but thankfully uh, they did all the work. Thank you for listening to my opinion. Cool. Y'all have no idea. Y'all had to... The ability to elevate them, uh, to give the mic directly to our families. And we, we created three compilations. One answered the question of, you know, how did remote learning go in the spring for you? Um, and, and we collected these in August. Um, you, you just saw the second one. And we really wanted to focus not just on like the issues, but what do you feel proud about? What did your family do and, and, and sort of what we were able to accomplish and, 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 and do together, right? Um, and then the third one about what you want to see be true in this coming school year. And so I know that we are, I'm, I'm over time, but um, very much a slice of, of how we've tried to just like seize the moment. And I'm like, okay, all we got is these devices. Let's make it happen. No, I think that um, it's so important because instead of trying to work around the reality of what we're dealing with, you all, you really leaned into what people are dealing with and made that part of addressing it. So I think that's a great example. Um, Bill Maurice. Thank you for sharing that with us, Maria. I, I, it's the second time, but it's just so special. So thank you. I'm going to share my screen too. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll actually go back a slide. Okay, here we go. Uh, so just wanted to reference Coffee and Community. This was a photo that I pulled from Instagram. It's also at the very end with just a few of us saying goodbye, but just thought it was cute with the Cisip Weather mug. Um, 
but that, like I said, was something that we were doing um, every month or every Monday at 8 a.m. And then we transitioned to just kind of meet the needs of our folks because again, like we're evolving and adapting, I think, to this virtual space in a way. Um, some events that we've hosted this past summer that were really successful, we hosted a series of watch parties. I think we've hosted four in total. Um, and what that means is essentially like 15 minutes before the state, Tennessee State Board of Education meeting started, we did sort of like a, with experts that are involved with the board, they came on, it was a Zoom webinar, and they just kind of did like a lay of the land of like, how does the Tennessee State Board work? How are decisions made? How is this linked to the department? You know, what is on the agenda? What's being proposed? How is it, vote? like just literally like the ins and outs of how the system itself works, right? But then also the interconnectedness with other systems. So they came on and really gave that like pre, uh, like session play by play. And then we live streamed um, these session, these committee meetings. And then in real time, people could ask questions. And then we would respond in the chat. The experts that would come in would respond in the chat. We would drop resources. Um, and people were just engaging in dialogue and we were all watching this live stream. And I think these watch parties, um, even for someone that now has been in this space for I think four years, and uh, like advocacy, like ed advocacy and policy work, but really working with students, I think doing things like this also makes your work approachable. Because I think sometimes like policy seems so like, what? Like, it seems like it doesn't make sense or it just seems so left field, even though like all those decisions are impacting your life in real time. I feel like it's designed to not feel approachable. So I think these watch parties really lent themselves to A, break down these systems for everyone, right? And level set, so we're all on the same page. And also as an opportunity to bring new people into, into the fold, into our work. Um, and then this little screenshot over here is just a photo of one of our uh, policy council meetings. Just wanted to drop that in there. Um, where's my mouse? Okay. And then uh, lastly, I know I mentioned Empower Ed, and um, we hosted a two-part series in partnership with Chalkbeat, Tennessee. So in May, early May, we had students, there was a high school panel and a college corner panel. And essentially the students, it was a space for them to share what it meant to do distant learning, online learning for school to abruptly end. And we had policymakers register, we had educators register, advocates register, and they were both well attended in the spring. And then we hosted our part two more recently in September to kind of see like, where are they now? Like, especially because every district is kind of doing something different. And then universities are also, you know, there's, we have students that are doing university now from their home. Some moved to campus, some are doing hybrid. So again, just giving them a moment in space to share like what is their reality and to also like voice like their recommendations or like what they wish could change. Um, so I view both of those events as like, or the, that series as very successful. We got a lot of great feedback. And I think genuinely, I could even see the growth uh, within our students from May to the second panel discussion. Like, just like they owned, like they had agency in, in talking this time. Not that they didn't in May, but I think it was such a new experience and process. But come September, like they were ready um, and they were shining. Um, so I definitely view that as successful. And then just wanted to drop this, um, this like little banner of images. So through our project, we had our students fill out a form, engage with us in one-on-ones and interviews to really figure out like what makes them iconic and if they, you know, had superpowers, what would it be? And what would their superhero uh, look like, right? What would their superhero version look like? So that lives on our website. Um, it's empoweredtn.org, I believe. I don't know if someone's dropping it in the chat. Um, so you can check out all of their profiles and see sort of what they're about and like how they really, you know, like how they want to change the world and what they aspire to. Um, and also some of their content, things that they've been involved with also live on certain profiles as well. Um, I think that's it for me though on this part. But yeah, so watch parties, panel discussions with students, um, and then also finding opportunities where when partners request a student voice, how can we like, you know, nominate one of our students to be involved in their conversations too. Thank you both. I, I feel like we have a ton more questions that we wanted to get to and we only have five minutes left. So I wanna make sure I open it up. Um, to folks on the Zoom, and I wish we had like all the more time in the world. It seems like 45 minutes 
it just flew by. Um, but so just opening up to everyone, feel free to unmute yourself and ask these questions. Just a few things to probe. If you have any clarifying questions, follow up for Vilmaris or Marielle, feel free to ask that. Um, but also if you have successful advocacy techniques or things that you've been doing that you want to share, um, please flag that. We will be doing a poll right at the very end um, to give you all opportunity if you want to stay connected with each other or with us on some of these follow-ups. We'll create some lists and, and do some follow-up after boot camp for that because uh, we really want to create a community of us leaning on one another across the country um, to, um, to create these, you know, support systems. So yeah, opening up to you all, questions, comments, concerns. Hi guys, I'll jump in. Um, I'm gonna just ask, first of all, offer something to the community. So first, thank you for building this space. It's been super helpful. I've got a lot of great ideas already. Um, I wanted to offer this to the community, something that we're working on in Texas is um, with our organization, we're trying to raise teacher voice and ensure that teacher voice is the center of all the decisions that are getting made in this really fast paced world right now. Um, so we're doing a campaign, excuse me, a classroom visit campaign. So we've had all of our teachers reach out to their elected officials where their schools are located and invite them either to their virtual or in-person classrooms um, to see the realities of what they're experiencing right now. Um, so that's the one I just wanted to offer up. We, we provided them with like a, a, a sample letter to their state elected official, a sample agenda, a sample principal letter if they needed permission, just to try and get that out there. Um, so th I, I would like to ask the community, what are other ways that folks are engaging um, elected officials or important decision makers at the state level, um, as we know that there's going to be conversations around budget cuts and trying to rethink how we do school and education. Um, and we're looking for creative ways to engage those elected officials. Hey guys, I'm in Kentucky, um, Penny Christian. Um, I'm in Kentucky. Hi guys. Um, I'm with, I'm with the state PTA. I'm a district president, but I'm with the state PTA. And when we had our convention this past summer, which was virtual, of course, <laughs> in case, um, I love it. I love you guys. I'm trying, listen, Ed Trust has, has just changed my life. I'm just putting it out there. Um, when we had our convention, we had, we actually added some extra classes that we don't normally do. And the sessions were, you know, how do you advocate during a pandemic? Right. So we had a panel discussion and it was district presidents, the state president and some outside community members who all have the same issue. We have now identified people that we had not identified before. Right. So what we've had to do, what we've chosen to do, I should say, is at the state level, we're contacting people and getting them to understand you need to reach out to your legislators. It can't just be us, but we'll sign on with you get them to understand that there is a difference now. And in Kentucky, I will tell you, public education has been gutted for years, for at least the past 10 to 15 years, okay? And there's been pushes for things like the tax credits and that sort of thing. So it hasn't been a priority. And when we went to them, we talked about the gap and we talked about these concerns. They never really, ah, it's not as bad as you think it is. Well, now that they're seeing it and some of them are actually living it, it's changed. So experiential things and anecdotal evidence has been crucial. And I am imploring my local unit presidents, gather that information and share it. Start it with the school board and then move up. Thank you, Penny. Yes, empower people with as much information as possible. So important. We are at time. Um, so I do really quick want to uh, give people the opportunity to just indicate if they want to be part of follow-up discussions and uh, creating a, a bit of a community of support for this. So feel free to um, indicate that in the poll right now. Um, it is in five minutes we'll be hearing from our fireside chat with Representative Ayanna Presley. So please head back to hop in for that. I can't emphasize enough the amazing work that Vilmaris, Marielle, your teams have been doing, everyone, the examples you've shown um, in this brief discussion we've had. Um, we will follow up 
we want to stay connected and we want to keep learning and growing together. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to save this chat and we will be following up. Thank you, friends. See you Thanks. in Hoppin. <laughs> Bye, everybody.